to me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Taylon, and I'm the chair of the Kawartha Lakes chapter of MCI. And be on behalf of our chapter, I'd like to welcome you all to the 2021 Muskies Canada Virtual Odyssey. The Kawartha Lakes chapter is excited to bring you presentations by Brent Bocek of Fish Envy Guide Service, Aaron Wilson from the University of Guelph, and Chris Wilson uh, of the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. I'll have more on them in just a minute. Kawartha Lakes chapter was founded in 2008 and very quickly became one of the larger chapters in MCI. We're a very active chapter with our meetings in non-COVID times, regularly bringing in 30 to 60 people. We have supported many research and conservation initiatives, such as the Lake Simcoe Muskie Restoration Project, the Bell River Tagging Study, the Quebec Study, and of course our own, of course, our own Kawartha Lakes Pike Invasion Project, both financially and often with manpower. Our chapter meetings are typically held on the second Thursday of each month. Currently, they're being done on the Zoom platform. If you're interested in our chapter or our meetings, please watch our social media on Facebook, Muskie's Canada Kawartha Lakes chapter, and on, M on Instagram at MCI Kawartha Lakes. When we finally get out of pandemic restrictions, uh, we're planning to hold our chapter meetings at the Peterborough Legion. Meetings typically feature guest speakers representing research and scientific community, fishing guides, bait makers, and representatives of the tackle industry. We've also had media personalities like Big Jim McLaughlin and Will Wegman, and, and representatives from the OPP Marine Unit featured at our meetings. Actually, all three of today's speakers have been speakers at Kawartha Lakes chapter meetings. Uh, we get involved in the community with our members participating in events with Wounded Warriors and Soldier On, Ontario Women Anglers, and the former Ducks Unlimited Green Wing Kids Fishing Derby, uh, which is now the OFA Under the Locks Fishing Derby, at least hopefully for 2022. We're also, fishing, we're also often at fishing and outdoor trade shows throughout our region. Our chapter outings are typically held with our fantastic hosts at Scotsman Point Resort on Buckhorn Lake on the third weekend in September. Uh, although for 2020, we had to shift to virtual uh, for our chapter. We're hoping that by September, 2021, we're once again able to gather at Scotsman Point for one of our typically fantastic events. One other note on Scotsman's Point Resort, they've been a generous sponsor of Muskie's Canada. Every year we donate lodge stays to each and every one of our chapters. Uh, they continue to do so even in these challenging times. I'd like to thank Scotsman's Point for the continued support of Muskies Canada. On MCI memberships, while being a me well, just being a member gets you some nice perks like our incredible release journal, to really get the most out of an MCI membership is really worth coming out to our chapter meetings, not just Kawartha Lakes events either. Get to all the meetings and outings you can for all the chapters. These events give you a chance to get really involved with a great community and speaking personally, I've met a, a number of great people and made some great friends that I probably would not have met without being an active member of MCI. Now, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our guest speakers for today. Uh, Brent Bocek has been a member of MCI since 1990. He is the host of Setting the Hook with Brent Bocek and owns Fish Envy Multi-Species Guide Service. He's pro staff with Low Boats, Abu Garcia, the Suic Lure Company, and Handlebars Muskie Lures. He'll be speaking on fishing the Kawarthas for this segment, and you'll have other couple, a couple other segments throughout the event. Uh, Aaron Wilson is a fourth year undergrad student studying marine and freshwater biology, and she's also a muskie angler. Her presentation will first focus on local and science knowledge regarding musky ecology in Balsam, Cameron, and Sturgeon Lakes. The second part will focus on themes from interviews relating to northern pike colonization in these lakes. Our third speaker, should he 
get on here is Chris Wilson, an aquatic research scientist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, specializing in aquatic biodiversity and genetics. Today, Chris will be giving a presentation on hybridization, which is certainly an interesting topic given the increasing presence of northern pike in the Kawartha's chain and the potential effects on our native musky populations. Oh, there's Chris, hi. <laughs> Uh, we're going to present these speakers one right after the other, and at the end, you can address any questions you might have for them. If you have any questions, please type them into the comments section with the person's name you wish to answer, address the question. That will help uh, to keep us organized and efficiently uh, direct them to the appropriate party. That's enough from me. Uh, at this point, I'd like to pass things off to our first speaker, uh, Mr. Brent Bocek. Well, thanks very much. I uh, really appreciate the introduction there. And this, this is just fantastic. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the last year we couldn't get into uh, do a real live odyssey. And uh, so, you know, doing this virtual stuff is uh, seems to be a new thing now. So um, first of all, I've been fishing the Quartha since uh, I joke around, but it's actually true since my mom was pregnant with me. So I started walleye fishing in the Quartha. Just really started getting into musky fishing when I was probably 16, 17, I really had a, a thing about musky. When I was 18 is when I really actually started musky fishing. And it's a lot longer than I care to admit, but uh, I became quite, uh, uh, you know, fishing in the courts is, is, is just, a, it's just a great fishery. I've been very fortunate to fish a lot of other places as well, but um, if we can just pull up my slides there, Pear. Thank you. So this is just a kind of a, a little map of the Quartha Lakes. Um, if we look at see there, balsam, balsam's kind of at the top of the chain where it flows out to uh, uh, Mitchell and Canal, eventually to Lake Simcoe and then out to Georgian Bay. And then if going the other way, we come out of balsam down to Cameron, Sturgeon, uh, Buckhorn. And some of the other lakes in there are, sorry, in the Pigeon, or um, yeah, Pigeon, then Buckhorn. We've got Chemung, Stony, and Rice Lake in there as well. There's a lot of other lakes in the Quarthas that are smaller, but if you're talking about the Quartha lakes, these are the main lakes that we're talking about. So uh, one thing when I first started, oh, actually, the Quartz Lakes used to be a major uh, link before, as I said, between Lake Huron and Lake Ontario. It also used to be a logging uh, for the logging region. It was a big thing for the logging region. So they've been around a long time. Um, here on Indian Ward for, uh, for the course was the bright waters and happy lands. And if anybody that's fished there can probably attest to that. One of the cool, uh, let's go on my next slide here. Oh, there we go. I got a monitor behind me, so I might have to look back there to see if I got my mouse on there. So for the most part, when I first started fishing the Quartha Lakes, we had bluegills, we had rock bass, perch, sunfish in there, um, walleye, large and small with bass, and, and musky. And with forage like that, you're not going to produce really, really big fish. You, you can get 50-inch fish in there. Um, all my years fishing the Quartha, I've got one 50-inch fish in the Quartha. I've got uh, numerous 48s and 46s and 47s. Uh, anything over 40 inch fish is a really good fish. Anything over 44, I consider a big fish. That's just personal uh, on how I look at it. Uh, I've seen in the papers uh, up in, in, in the courts is where people they say they've got a 40 pound fish and they got a picture of it and it just doesn't it just doesn't justify it. Um, the picture doesn't justify saying it's a 40 pound fish. You don't have the forage in there like you do in Georgian Bay or the or the Ottawa River or say the St. Lawrence River to produce a fish of that with that girth. In order to have a fish that big, you have to have the forage. It has to have the girth. In recent years, we've had an invasion of pike into the Corthus and also crappies. As I said, I've been fishing there since I was born, and I think probably about 10, 15 years ago, somebody said they caught a crappie there, and I didn't believe them. Uh, when they first said, it, oh, I figured maybe it was a sunfish or something. Uh, so we do have an invasion of crappie, which also can affect the musky, pip, uh, musky population. And also the invasion of pike in recent years, as Aaron's going to talk uh, a lot more in depth than I am about it. Uh, balsam has a, a pretty good pike population. Unfortunately, Cameron's starting to get a, a lot more pike in it as well. And I'm sure they've made their way down to sturgeon as well. One of the, uh, the things with muskies is, in the course of the lakes, we have 100% natural uh, reproduction. There's no stocking there at all. And so that's where that's where catch and release is imperative um, to ensure future or future fishery there. Without catch and release, 
or catch and release, it, it's um, improper handling as well. You know, it's one thing to release a fish, but if you don't handle the fish properly, it's not going to survive. Muskies do make up less than 1% of our fish population out there. So proper handling and proper release techniques are going to help ensure future populations. Unfortunately, when we get the pike in there, oops, when we get the pike in there, they're battling for spawning grounds. There's only so many places. The Kortha lakes aren't really huge. They're, some of them are bigger than others, of course, but they're not overly big lakes. There's only so many spawning areas for these fish. And I have some slides later of a bunch of tiger muskie that we've caught there over the years. What's happening is you get a few pike in there, you end up getting tiger muskie, um, whether it's an early spawning pike, or pardon me, an early, early spawning muskie or late spawning pike or vice versa. What happens is whenever you get a hatch of uh, tiger muskies, they're not able to produce. So actually, I'm not going to go too far into that because uh, Aaron's going to get into that a lot more later on. Here's a here's a 46 inch muskie. As you can see, it's not a really thick fish. It's quite thin, especially towards the back end. Um, what we have there is, it looks like it's you know the girth at the front isn't too bad. The girth across the back wasn't too bad, but it's getting quite thin. Um, that's a little bit thinner than a day than your average muskie that we'd catch on the Kortha lakes. I, what I think of that is that's just it was a healthy fish. It looked good. It fought good. I think it's just a very old fish. On average, our muskies in the quarters are starting to get a little bit thicker. As you can see, there's a shot across the back of a fish. It's a little bit thicker. That was uh, that thick was very well proportionate. But we're not going to get fish with those big bellies like you do in some of the Great Lake systems, like Georgia Bay, the Niagara, uh, the St. Lawrence, and, and stuff like that. You're not going to get those big bellies. They're not feeding on that high protein forage uh, like ciscos and and, and uh, possibly trout, moon eye, stuff like that. So there's a um, there's a tiger muskie that we've got in the Quarthas. Um, as I said, I got a picture a little bit later on of a whole bunch of them that we've caught. You'll notice their fins are a little bit more rounded. Their heads a little bit bigger. There's a distinct color pattern different on it from a clear muskie, which we'll see here. See, there's really no markings on them there. Most muskies you catch in the Quarthas are quite clear. Younger ones quite often will have some stripes on them, especially if they're out of the weeds. And Possibly for a, a new musk angler could be confused with a tiger, but here's a tiger You really see up on the cheeks and everything else. You got all the markings all along the back all the stripes So it's more of a light body with dark markings as far as I can tell um, And there again, there's just a regular clear musky um, So another thing that we're fighting in the courts of lakes we used to fight it quite a bit. I don't see it as much now. I think you can maybe blow that picture up, uh, Pierre. So what we have there, that was a 44-inch fish. The girth is, it's not really girthy fish. It's kind of, uh, it's a little on the, on the slender side. But what you see there is, it's called lymphocytoma. It's a cancerous growth. Now, I'm not sure what um, Musty's can recommend recommending to do right now when you catch a fish like this. Obviously, if it's below the legal size limit, it has to be released. My understanding is that those passes back and um, this 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 cancerous growth back and forth during a spawn uh, during spawning periods um, when they're rubbing up against each other when they're spawning. I'm not a scientist. I'm not 100% sure on that. That's just my understanding of it. But we used to recommend that if it was a legal size fish that you would harvest it. Um, Maybe uh, somebody else can uh, type in on that a little bit better. And uh, if anybody has any inf more information on that, but it's just something to be aware of when you're in your boat. Um, if you get that in your boat, make sure you clean everything up. If it uh, if you get stuff oozing from it, so. But that was um, oops, lost my mouse here. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. This is a, a number of tiger muskies that we've caught on Balsam and Cameron just over the last five, six years. Um, as you can see, it's a real problem. And all these fish here, uh, my understanding is the tiger muskies like a mule. It can't reproduce. So, it, you know, they're beautiful fish. They're great to catch. They're fun to catch. Uh, they actually, I find they fight a little bit harder than a natural muskie. But unfortunately, as I said, they can't reproduce. So, um, um, hopefully there's going to be some more there's going to be some more studies uh, i know aaron's involved in studies with this with, with the uh, tiger muskie in the port of the lakes 
hopefully we can, uh, I don't know what can happen with it, but uh, as I said, I think uh, they're using the same spawning areas and I think we're going to see more and more of them. And hopefully it doesn't doesn't come to the end of the muskie and especially those upper lakes like Cameron and Balsam. So if we can just uh, stop sharing the slides there. Oh, there we go, thank you. So how much time do I have left there? So fishing in the core of the lakes, we have, um, they're quite a weedy lake. One of the things I like to do, especially early in the year, well, we have no time. Am I running out of time? Okay. Looks like I'll just going to take a couple minutes here and I'll be really quick. Throwing a lot of jerk baits. I got one minute. Okay. Thanks, Pierre. <laughs> I could go on for the whole hour, so, but I won't. Um, Fishing the Corthus, a couple of baits you're going to want. You're going to want a couple of jerk baits. You're going to want a couple of uh, uh, spinner baits. I love throwing silks and handlebars. They work really great. If you get on a weed edge, it's a great place to start. If you haven't fished a Corthus before, uh, rocky points are also great, especially when they're hit, being hit with the wind. Uh, as I said, I could go on and on, but uh, I'm going to let Aaron, I guess you're up next. I'll let you take over. And thank you very much for having me, guys. Thanks, Brent. That was uh, that was pretty great, and you'll definitely see some of your photos in my presentation that you sent me. So it's a good kind of connection there. Um, so I'll just share my screen here. I got this up and going. All right. Can you guys see that? Okay. Yeah, you're good, Aaron. Okay. Awesome. So for my undergraduate thesis for my fourth year, um, I looked at the role of local and science knowledge regarding uh, muscalunge ecology, and I decided to focus on the Kawartha Lakes um, for a case study. So just to give a brief overview, um, I'm going to start with the background and then go into the results and discussion of my research. Um, and then lastly, I'll obviously focus on the pike colonization. So the main focus of my research was on knowledge systems and a knowledge system is how knowledge is produced, organized, stored, distributed, and used within social systems. And a lot of you may not even realize that you're actually part of a local knowledge system, which is simply a social network of individuals that live in the same general region, which learn about the state's nature. And so the local knowledge system can contribute reliable ecological knowledge about an individual species that they have had a long term experience with. And ecological studies that have included local knowledge holders have found uh -oh. knowledge about the focus species distribution, abundance, mating, diet, and behavior. And some great examples of local knowledge holders um, that ha would have this long term personal experience. Uh, with a specific species uh, would, be would be people like yourselves, you know, such as anglers, hunters, naturalists, uh, boaters. And so on the other hand is the science knowledge system, which is a social network of individuals that apply the scientific method with an emphasis on the use of hypotheses in order to learn about the states of nature. And so science ecological knowledge and ecological studies uh, tend to have explicit hypotheses uh, that are then tested by predictions. Um, and most ecological studies within the science knowledge system are conducted without any consideration of the local knowledge system. So the focus species for my study is the muskie, um, obviously. <laughs> um, and then I chose to focus on balsam, Cameron, and sturgeon lakes for my study. And so the identified research question um, for my undergraduate thesis was to what extent do local and science expert knowledge systems differ regarding their breadth and depth of understanding about muskie ecology? So this then generated the time on the water hypothesis, which states that local expert knowledge holders spend more time near muskie habitat than science expert knowledge holders providing the local experts with direct experience that significantly increases their understanding about muskie ecology. So this then generated the prediction that if that hypothesis was true, then interviews with local experts would exhibit a greater frequency of statements about the conditions and or causations of muskie ecology. 
And so the first thing I had to do was identify and invite expert knowledge holders. So recommendations made by the Kawartha Lakes chapter of Muskies Canada, Kawartha Conservation and the MNR were extremely helpful um, in identifying both the local and the science experts I could interview. Um, and then additional experts were identified by referrals made during the interview. So next was to develop uh, the semi-structured interview questions that would be used for the interview as a guide. So the first part of the interview had a focus on the interviewee's experience with muskies in general. The second part of the interview focused on interviewee's knowledge about muskie ecology within the BCS system. And then the last part of the interview focused on the interviewee's perspective on the ecological threats of muskies in the balsam cameron sturgeon system, which obviously included um, the pike colonization. Um, the interviews were then transcribed and extractions were coded, and I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail how this was done, but I'll provide an example. So an example question during the interview was, in general, where and when can muskies be found in the BCS system? And so an example answer to this from a knowledge holder would be, you can find them out chasing schools of bait in the open water, but that's pretty tough in this lake. They're all going to be related to some kind of structure. And so the coding related to this was at the population level, and it was a causation statement. And the sub factor for the ecological level was the distribution. So now on to the results. So a total of 10 interviews were completed with six local and four science knowledge holders. Uh, the local knowledge holders were all muskie anglers with intimate experience with the BCS system. You can see Brett's there. <laughs> uh, the science knowledge holders included two Ministry of Natural Resource Biologists, one aquatic biologist from Corp the Conservation, and one instructor from Carleton University. For the local knowledge holders, they were all males uh, between the ages of 43 to 72, and interviews ranged from about two hours to three hours. For the science knowledge holders, they were also all males ranging from 34 to 67 years of age, and their interviews ranged from about an hour and a half to three hours. And so when looking at the frequency of condition statements made about musky ecology at the individual level, the local knowledge holders made a higher number of statements um, when compared to the science knowledge holders. Um, and this is also true for the causation statements at the individual level of musky ecology. Um, a similar trend was also found at the population level of musky ecology. Uh, for both the condition and causation statements as well. Um, however, at the community level, there was only a difference for the number of condition statements, and it wasn't as big compared to the other levels. Um, and similarly, this was also true at the ecosystem level. So therefore, um, there is an increased confidence in the time on the water hypothesis because the local knowledge holders displayed a higher breadth of knowledge at all ecological levels, um, as well as a higher depth of knowledge, but that was only found at the population and community level. So some of the general trends that were found from the interviews with the local knowledge holders was that they shared a lot of detailed knowledge on behaviors such as feeding, um, mating, the preferred habitat of muskies, um, as well as muskie distribution and abundance. Um, and when comparing this to similar studies that include anglers, um, a common reasoning would be that anglers have to have this in-depth knowledge on these topics in order to be successful at angling a specific species uh, such as muskies. For the science knowledge holders, uh, some of the general trends found from the interviews were that they had detailed knowledge on the BCS fish communities, uh, biotic and abiotic factors associated with muskies, um, and lastly environmental threats, uh, which um, could be influenced by the types of professional careers that the science knowledge holders are in. So in conclusion, it supported that local knowledge can make important contributions to the science knowledge system by identifying previously unexplored observations, which can lead to the development of potential hypotheses for further investigations. 
So from studying uh, local and science knowledge systems regarding um, ecological knowledge, it has become very apparent that the inclusion of local knowledge in ecology and natural resource management um, is essential. And so a great example of many hypotheses that need further exploring from these interviews is the pike colonization in Balsam and Cameron um, and Sturgeon. So the Kortha lakes are unique in the sense that their muskie populations um, have not evolved over a long time scale with northern pike, um, like other systems such as, you know, Georgian Bay or the St. Lawrence. Um, it, it's been reported that like the development of the Trent Severn um, Canal does aid the pike colonization by connecting all these lakes um, and therefore enhancing migrations, which we saw with pike and crappie. Um, and it's been officially reported that uh, pike and hybrids are found in Balsam and Cameron, and it's kind of been reported in sturgeon, I think through um, anglers, but it's kind of not official, I guess. <laughs> um, and essentially along with musky knowledge, uh, Questions in the interviews included the knowledge holders' observations of northern pike and hybrids in uh, BCS, as well as possible hypotheses that both the muskie anglers and scientists thought would explain how pike are potentially outcompeting muskies. Uh, so some of the interesting observations that came out of the interviews were that there was a large abundance of hybrids being caught in these systems when compared to other systems. And that kind of makes you think, well, there's obviously an overlap in spawning because that's how it works. Um, and then another was the average size of balsam muskie populations um, have increased. So that means that you know, year classes, younger year classes maybe aren't as successful, which is driving that average up. Um, and then lastly, catch per unit effort for pike is much higher than muskies and balsam, meaning that they are potentially out competing them. So both the muskie anglers and scientists did come up with very similar hypotheses. Um, so young of year predation was probably the most common one. Um, so the fact that pike do spawn first and are larger than muskies and therefore are predating on them. The overlap of spawning, which could be due to many different factors uh, mentioned, such as these lakes warming up faster. So there is more overlap. Um, indirect competition was another one. So the fact that pike may be consuming the prey that supports muskies at the, all the different life stages. Um, and lastly, evolution. So the fact that this colonization has only been observed for maybe the past 40 years. That's what I kind of got from these interviews. And that maybe in a hundred or more years or even longer, um, that these fish actually might evolve to live together um, like on other systems. So in conclusion, these interviews included a wealth of unexplored hypotheses related to balsam, cameron, and sturgeon. I intend to follow up these uh, with these a little bit more formally uh, within the next year with my advisor, uh, Dr. Steve Crawford as I will have um, a little bit more free time. Uh, and these hypotheses identified uh, could provide an excellent research project. And I know that we have a question period, but if your question gets missed or anything, this is my email, so you can quickly jot it down if you'd like, and then I will reply to you um, as soon as possible. Okay, thanks, Aaron. I think we're gonna uh, move on to Chris right now. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay. Uh, whoops. Sorry, I was going to jump into sharing. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Say yes. Not yet. <laughs> oh, lovely. All right. Well, um, basically, Brent and Aaron have both given me a great lead in in terms of talking about. Uh, muskie in the core. And it's basically a geographic stronghold. So if you look at muskellunge across the landscape, well, we may have to do this without. Um, oh, here we go. Sorry, this worked. I tried it before. Um, if you look across the landscape at muskellunge, they, they don't have a continuous distribution. So you can see there is a basically a geographic cluster right in the corpus. 
we have essentially been there since the Ice Age. So soon after the, the glaciers left, Muskellunge moved in. They've literally been there for thousands of years. And for Muskellunge, this was a paradise. So that there, there was all the Kawartha Lakes. There's also lots of interconnecting uh, streams, wetlands, so lots of spawning habitat, virtually no pressure. They, they were the kings in these watersheds. So th this uh, slide basically shows the connectivity 2,000 and 4,000 years ago. And you can see lots of water, lots of connection. Then we came along. First Nations were not a problem. Um, and the commercial fisheries, construction of the Trent Severn Waterway, introduction of invasive species, removal of uh, wild rice beds, changing of spawning habitats to cottage country. It's actually amazing they're still here. And despite that, the Kawartha populations have been strong enough, they were used as a stocking source for decades through the mid 20th century. So in the midst of all of this, the populations were still strong enough. We were using them to plant them elsewhere. And from the genetic work my lab has done, we basically, there's one continuous population through the Kawartha Lake. So where Brent was showing all the different lakes, we have samples from most of these, basically see one continuous population. Now, it doesn't mean it's all, they're all breeding in one spot. We know several spawning locations and they're very important habitats to protect, as Brent has talked about and the minister mentioned this morning. So with that, uh, it's just there's so much movement, so much habitat still, even in this somewhat impaired state. It's one continuous population. This is very different from what we see elsewhere. I'm just going to touch on this very briefly, and many of you have seen this. So if we're looking in Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, all the populations are very distinct from each other. Look up in the Kawartha Lakes, much more similar. And if we break this down to an individual basis here, just... The different colors show proportional ancestry to particular genetic groups. And you can see the Kawarthas are one continuous group. And even Lake Kuchiching is very similar to them. You look elsewhere, every site is its own population. So with that, we've got great connectivity, lots of movement, gene flow. It's helped to keep the Kawartha healthy. And it reflects both this historical connectivity before we change the rules. Also, they're still using the locks now. So now that we've created the Trent Severn, the muskie are still able to get around. And one bit of evidence we have from this with the Simcoe restoration effort, most of the muskie that we're finding in Lake Simcoe are from the Kawartha and they stand out very clearly. So this connectivity is helping maintain the population. As Aaron said, it, it also creates the vulnerability that we've, we've got basically a gated system for allowing invasive species in. And Brent and Aaron have both touched on this already. We have musk or uh, lake expanding through the course as they've been in Balsam Lake for the better part of a century, and they're moving downstream. They're also moving upstream from the Bay of Quinty, so they're coming in both directions. And the core core the lakes, um, they are probably here as well, and just we're not seeing them in numbers yet. And you've already heard where we have pike, we have tiger muskellunge, and they're beautiful fish, but they're a good indicator that the pike are expanding through the system. So here are the, these uh, yellow triangles show everywhere where uh, either tigers have been reported or we have genetic samples from them. And again, it's very likely that they're in more places than we're seeing. Now, the good news is, and Prince already referred to this, tiger muscalunge are sterile, to the best of our knowledge. So when we do genetic analysis on, on these, we're only seeing first generation hybrid. There's no indication at all that hybrids are interbreeding back with either pike or muskellunge. So as Brent said, these are functionally mules with fin. And that's actually very good news for the local muskellunge. So we're losing some reproductive effort when a muskellunge breeds with pike, but we're not changing muskellunge into something else. There's no evidence of pike genes showing up in muskie in the Kawarthas or elsewhere actually. So you can see there's pike, there's muskellunge, and the hybrids are only smack in between. But just first generation, there's no gene flow. Now this hybridization is also happening in both directions. When we've looked at mitochondrial DNA of both species and the hybrid, you only really get mitochondrial DNA from your mother. So by looking at the, the mitochondrial DNA in these hybrids, we can say which species was the mother and which one wasn't. 
And what we're seeing is that hybridization happens in both directions. So in the states, they tend to do just one direction only. It's whatever sex it's easier to get females for, that's your mother. But the hybrids themselves, they can be created in either direction. It doesn't affect their survival, doesn't affect, uh, affect their color pattern either. So they're these beautiful fish, and basically it's kind of exciting when you get one. And as Brent mentioned, they fight quite well. The difficulty is getting samples. So I, I winged out when I saw Brent slide from uh, Balsam and Cameron. I have one heck of a time getting samples. And it basically people will scrape off some scales, put them in an envelope, and mail them to me. So trying to get a closer look at the dynamics between pike, muskie, and their hybrids. So this was suggested by Steve Kerr a couple of years ago. What we're trying to do is get anglers and cottagers in Jack Lake sampling pike and muskie and tigers that they come across. So far, they haven't caught pike in Jack Lake. So either the tigers are migrating in as juveniles or the pike are in very low numbers. And one thing we're doing is looking at how many families do these hybrids represent? How many mating events with pike does this show up? You can see all of these guys look kind of happy about catching these things. As I said, they're, they're spectacular looking fish. They fight well. There's some really interesting ecological and evolutionary things going on here. And it's right in the heart of the core. So keeping this short, but just you already heard earlier today, Ontario is the Muscalon stronghold across the species range. We have more native populations than any other jurisdiction. And the Kaworthas are one of those big concentrations. We're living in the middle of a local stronghold. And so far, the populations are still doing well. And basically, in part, that's because of the local knowledge and anglers telling the MNRF how to manage these sustainably. So the habitat management, promoting the catch and release, these are both two big reasons the populations are still doing as well as they are. They are under threat and under stress. The tiger muskies themselves are not a significant threat. They're an indication where pike are expanding in, but the only impact that they have on muscalunge is purely ecological as another mouth to feed. They're not a genetic threat in themselves. Basically, if you see one, enjoy it, get some photos, and if you can, send me some samples. And I'm gonna wrap it up there. Thank you. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks to Chris, Aaron, and Brent for uh, for their presentations today. Uh, you made me look somewhat competent here, so that's you know in terms of organizing this thing. So that's great. Um, I did see the one question uh, related to growth rates. Uh, there, there we go. Pierre's got it up. Is a tiger's growth rate the same as a clear muskie? Either you guys want to answer that? My, my understanding is that they grow a lot quicker than a natural muskie. Yes, they do. I, I don't know the scientifics behind it, but... They're not investing in gonads at all, so everything goes into growth. This is actually really common for hybrids. They're also much easier to raise in a hatchery environment. So it, it, the people at Fleming and the MNRF can both tell you it's brutal to try to raise muscalunge in a hatchery setting. Tiger muscalunge are much, much easier. Okay, Pierre, do we have any other questions that came up? So, hey, Steve, I, I actually have a question for you. Um, Sorry uh, for Chris. Um, sample, you were talking about scale samples. So you'd like some scale samples of tiger muskies. Oh, Chris is muted right now. Sorry about oh, that. There we go. Um, yeah, so the information on the Muskies Canada website on how to take samples is still good. It, it's basically get a photo, um, just scrape a few scales off with the tip of a fish hook or a pocket knife. Uh, don't clean the scales, just pop them in an envelope and mail them to me. Okay, and so should the scales come from anywhere in particular on the fish, like by the tail, close to the head, or does it matter? What we've typically been doing is a um, upper back, a little, a little behind or close to the dorsal fin, but it doesn't really matter. 
and basically it, it's not causing any harm to the fish. The scales grow back fairly quickly. Okay. That's great. Hopefully I'll, uh, I'll be able to uh, send you some samples. Yep. And I think the information is, is still on the Muskies Canada website. Okay. So yeah, uh, the only one I ever kept, ever caught was in Balsam Lake and it, it was a great day. <laughs> the first one I caught in Balsam uh, was in Balsam also. Actually, Aaron had that picture up there. That was, uh, that was more than a few years ago. <laughs> okay. uh, Brent, I think that question on the screen is for you or Jerry. Uh, does rice lake have a good population of muskies? Yes, it does. Well, well you can well, go ahead there, Jerry. I haven't fished Rice Lake very much. It's uh, it's not my preferred lake, but yes, it's it's always had a, a pretty decent population of muskies. I know that the uh, the pike invasion is well in effect in there, um, so we'll we'll see what happens to the population over the coming years as we as we see these problems with uh, that Aaron described in Balsam. Cameron and Sturgeon uh, as they're happening in Rice Lake and the Autonomy River. And I believe they're all the way up into Little Lake as well. So. Now, the, the other, sorry, before we get to that question, the, um, the other invasive species I'm particularly worried about is round goby. So like we heard earlier today as an egg predator and chasing out the other forage species. And they, they are as far upstream as Little Lake and Peterborough now. I guess one of the issues with around goby is I'm eating eggs. Yes, it's a big issue. I believe we're going to hear quite a bit about that during the St. Lawrence, the Gananoque presentations. Okay. Um, so we have another another question. How far away will the average muskie travel from spawning grounds and vice versa? I live on Shemong Lake and have been lucky enough to see some good size couples spawning in a small bay. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we know they're able to move through the lock system, so they're not limited to living in Shimon Lake. So, for instance, we, we see fish from Lake Kugog make it into the other Kawartha Lakes. We're seeing Kawartha Lake fish moving through the lock system into Lake Kumko. Hmm. And in, in Georgian Bay, we can see them moving over 50 kilometers, but then they come home to breed. Um, the odds are, if you're watching that little bay, you'll be seeing the same fish year after year. There's some evidence they actually mate with, this, they keep the same mate year after year. That's really interesting. Um, as far as fish if angling goes, uh, early in the season, if you can find, if you can locate spawning areas, uh, and you know where fish will, will will be in the summertime, you can pretty much cut those fish off and angle and, and fish for them in, in points and little bays, little wee beds along the way to where you figure they're going to be in the summertime because they're going to take their time moving back to their summer home. All right, we've uh, we've used up our allotted time. Once again, I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Chris, Aaron, and Brent. Uh, you did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we're going to pass it back over to our MC, Mr. Ryan Pickering. Thank Thanks you, guys. Uh, really Thanks. excellent. Uh, in fact, I made some notes to, uh, to talk about later, and uh, we have been making some major progress over on the auction. <laughs> I am out of breath.